everyone, I'm Rubina. And I'm Layla. Welcome back to our channel, Nutrition Unpacked. Where we try our diets so you don't have to. This past week, we tested out going dairy-free. I think we both kind of said that we didn't really rely on dairy so much in our diets, but I actually realized from doing this, I think I have more dairy than I think I do. I'm at the office today, and I was just about to indulge in one of my favorite snacks that we have out there here at the office goldfish i like poured them out in a plate and everything and then i realized that they're made with real cheddar i went through that same process more so i think there are a number of whey based products that mm. i do rely on and i forgot to take that into account when i was thinking about it last week because i don't think i necessarily have like milk i think i just forgot about all the things that i add milk to so like my oatmeal my tea we have cheese snacks at work mm -hmm. it was actually harder than i expected it to be especially with our little added twist to things of trying to get enough calcium and protein the intention of this challenge is of course to kind of see how we can make sure we're getting a nutritionally adequate diet both with dairy and without dairy and to kind of show you guys, depending on what your lifestyle is, how you can achieve that goal. I have to say my least favorite part was just a very act of tracking my food intake. Ah, oh, it's such a pain in the butt. I don't know how people do it. I, like, I know people that do it kind of religiously on mm -hmm. a daily basis. It's valuable. Just so you guys know, I don't normally like measure out my yogurt like this diligently. I just want to be very accurate about the fact that, you know, I am getting that 250 milligrams of calcium that's promised in this product. But it's not a good time. Last week, we really talked about, you know, where this dairy-free trend is coming from and how we've seen a greater adoption of a dairy-free diet. And also talked a little bit more about, you know, the effects of dairy on health. I think there's a lot of fear mongering about cow's milk, dairy in general, causing all these different diseases. And we kind of tried to dispel some of those myths and talk about how dairy in the diet can actually be beneficial for health, depending on what your goals are. So if you missed that video, definitely check that out and then come back and watch this one. Today, we're gonna dive into some of the main nutrients that we tend to get from dairy. If you are going dairy-free, how you can make sure that you're getting those nutrients, even with the foods that you can include. Even though we did talk about the fact that, you know, dairy can be part of a very healthy diet and can be a nutritious part of a healthy diet, there's many, many reasons why someone might be dairy-free. Environmental reasons, ethical reasons around the production of dairy, allergies, lactose intolerance, personal preference, maybe you just don't like dairy. There are quite a few different reasons why people avoid dairy. Rubina, tell me about your strategy when you were going into this dairy-free week and making sure that we're getting calcium, getting protein, getting all that good stuff in. I wanted to get the biggest bang for my buck. Mm. So one thing that I incorporated this past week was tofu. I'm going to be cooking with tofu for the first time in my life today. Tofu is one of those things where I've heard so many good things. I see these gorgeous recipes on TikTok I, and I've had tofu. Like I, I order them at restaurants and stuff and it's delicious. I hear a lot that it's very easy to not do it right and I don't know texture stuff if you don't prepare it properly but you know what minimalist baker has never steered me wrong so I'm gonna trust her and I'm gonna make a tofu scramble let's do a taste test shall we so good so good minimalist baker she knows what she's doing it was delicious and it was so easy to prepare so I'm actually excited to kind of play around with it a little bit more with the amount that I'm planning on eating just the tofu scramble itself is going to give me about 450 milligrams of calcium and almost 24 grams of protein which is incredible I also started getting canned salmon with the bones in okay so I mashed up some avocado and put some hot sauce in there along with some black pepper so let's give it a, a tasty roux mmm bones it actually surprises me that it's almost it's kind of a mainstream product so i actually really did struggle quite a bit okay guys so today is the first day of going dairy free and i have made a grave just mistake that mistake is not planning so i have no idea what i'm gonna eat i'm not eating before the gym and i have to be at work very shortly thereafter so i don't know what I'm having for breakfast that's high in calcium and dairy free like i went grocery shopping once and then i just didn't want to like go back and buy other stuff i got creative my whole google search this whole week was the amount of calcium in X food. I'm at the office and we have a lot of really great snacks, but I realize so many of them are dairy based. So we have yogurt, cheese, cream cheese, apparently goldfish crackers. So I've been looking for things we have that aren't dairy based that are high in calcium. So I found 
um, these Kirkland Signature Dry Roasted Almonds. And I didn't really realize this before, but almonds are a pretty good source of calcium. In a half cup, it has 10% of my daily requirement of, of calcium with 125 milligrams. So I'm gonna have about a half cup of these to tie me over until lunchtime. Two things that brought my calcium up was first fortified milks. I'm gonna try this milk. It's like some plant milk and it's a mix of a bunch of different ones so it has coconut oat chicory root came it has all kinds of different stuff in here so i really want to try it to see what it's like it has like some cow print on it so i feel like it's supposed to taste like milk let me give this a try it does taste quite nice actually this is pretty good also though seeds most seeds are a very good source of calcium specifically chia seeds poppy seeds and sesame seeds very good sources of calcium so here is my little snack i got my peanut butter toast with poppy seeds and as you can see there's a lot of poppy seeds on there because um to get like a decent amount of calcium i had to use a whole tablespoon at the time i was doing it a tablespoon did not seem like that much but now seeing it on the toast itself it does seem like a lot i was definitely pre-tracking on my app so i'm just sitting here doing the math on my calcium and protein for the day uh, looking at my totals for the day based on kind of what i've pre-tracked i do have a tiny tiny bit like five milligrams to go on the calcium i did purchase cashew milk that has been fortified with calcium so i'm just gonna find a way to sneak that in i don't know if i was pre-tracking but there was a lot of like oh my god it's 7 p.m i've already had dinner i'm only at 80 percent so here i am with my smoothie honestly i didn't add too much to it i just had some frozen fruit that i had in that milk and honestly it tastes kind of bad but you know what it's getting me to my calcium goal for today so bottoms up what am i gonna do because i actually i failed one day so the reason we're talking about calcium is because dairy products do tend to contribute quite a bit to people's calcium intake especially in the north american context Depending on age and certain other demographic variables, it tends to contribute about 50% of our calcium intake. Calcium is a very, very important nutrient. I think typically when we think about calcium, we think about bones and teeth. That makes perfect sense. But actually calcium plays much bigger roles than even that. And I shouldn't say maybe bigger roles, but it actually does play much wider roles than just that. It's involved in nerve impulses, our muscles contracting, our heart beating. It's also involved in hormone secretion and cellular control communication. If your calcium levels are off just a tiny bit, you will die. So your body tries to keep your blood calcium at like the exact right range all the time. It's interesting. We think of calcium, we think of for our bones, but I'd say that when, when our body thinks of it, our bones are kind of just like, yeah, they're straight there for structure and whatever, but they're also calcium storage. So because calcium is so important for all these essential functions, like keeping your heart beating, your body's like, you know what? We can spare the bones. We'll spare the bones so that we can keep everything, you know, alive for right now. What that means is that if you're not getting enough calcium in through your diet, this can have a negative effect on your bone health because your body's always going to prioritize having enough calcium in your blood to keep, you know, everything going than enough calcium in your bones. Our bones are super weird. Like they go through a continuous process called bone remodeling. So we have cells in our bones called osteoblasts that are there to kind of build up our bone. We have cells called osteoclasts that break down your bone. The rate at which each of these processes are happening is somewhat dependent on our blood calcium levels, which are very, very tightly regulated. So we are finding that, you know, we're consistently low in our calcium food intake. That can mean that the rate of bone resorption is is much higher than bone ossification over time that can compromise our bone density. This is really important for, especially for certain groups of people, especially women, older women, and also children. For children, we really want them to grow. Having enough calcium is important for their bones to grow. There is research that shows that children that don't consume dairy products might end up being shorter than children that do consume dairy. There was one observational study that found that when they looked at three-year-olds that drank three cups of dairy milk versus three cups of non-dairy milk every single day, the kids that had the non-dairy milks were actually 1.5 centimeters shorter than the ones that drank the dairy milk. We do see this finding pretty consistently throughout the literature. Of course, when we're looking at observational cross-sectional studies, there's so many different reasons why this could be. But, you know, that is quite interesting to know. And, you know, we were talking about the importance of calcium for building bones obviously if your bones are growing you need more calcium we're talking about protein for just building structures in general honestly when i think about what my diet was like when i was 10 11 i literally like randomly went through a phase where like i didn't eat breakfast i only had like nutella sandwiches and i had like three granola bars like granola bars in mm. a day as snacks i think my only meal where i actually had protein was probably dinner like i genuinely feel like maybe i could have been like a like, full two. inch yeah, yeah. I probably maybe I don't know. Yeah, for context, you're like five one. Five I'm five one. one. Oh, you're five one. Okay, yeah. you're short five one. <laughs> 
Okay. I think I'm like a little above five one. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So I think I could have been a solid five two. I had I a think better you could diet. Have Three cups of milk. So, yeah, what is this? I blame my parents on that one. And then all that to say is, surprise, surprise, <laughs> nutrition is important for children. When we're talking about making like substitutions or having eliminations of certain foods in the diet, it's really important to think about, okay, well, what effect could this be having on nutrients and making sure that we have very deliberate attempts and efforts to make sure that they're getting enough calcium, protein, etc. Additionally, in women, we see higher rates of something called osteopenia or even worse, osteoporosis. When you hear about older adults having things like fractures and that being a time that can be very dangerous and perhaps very disabling for the rest of their life. So we really need to be focusing on having a diet that is rich in good sources of calcium. Most adults need about a thousand milligrams a day of calcium. This number does go up to 1200 milligrams for females over the age of 50 and for males over the age of 70. What's Incredible is that I feel like in the last year or so, at least based on my own observation, it seems like the food industry has really recognized this trend and has responded to try to improve the nutrition in a lot of the plant-based alternatives. A lot of the plant-based milks out there are now fortified with a variety of different vitamins and minerals, including calcium. This week I've been using this cashew milk with my vegan protein powder just to sneak in a little bit more calcium. Cashew milk in and of itself does not necessarily necessarily high in calcium, but the Silk brand does have a pretty impressive vitamin and mineral blend in one cup of this you actually get 300 milligrams of calcium. And they've also added a bunch of other nutrients as well, that like ones that you would typically find in a dairy milk product. Vitamin A, riboflavin, vitamin D2, and vitamin B12. Which is really fabulous to see. Like even like a lot of them do have comparable amounts to dairy milk. I think it shows, you know, how consumer demand can really drive industry. And for a while it was a very large concern because people were giving their kids these dairy alternatives instead of having milk. One surprising thing that you might not think about though is it seems like some of the, the added minerals might actually end up settling out in the bottom of the carton. I mean, and the cartons, I think pretty much all of them do say to shake well before use. I know I don't really listen to that recommendation, uh, but it does seem like in some cases, if we don't shake it up, the actual amount of calcium that you end up getting with regular use might end up being around 30%. And even with shaking it up, it seems like we might get closer to that 60% mark. There is some question about, you know, how much of that calcium that's theoretically in the carton is actually consumed by people. Along with that note, there is a little bit of a question on bioavailability. It's like how well can your body actually absorb and use that calcium? That's also something to keep in mind, but I would say having a plant milk with added calcium is definitely better than a plant milk without it. Ultimately, the best thing to do is definitely check out the label. All of these products are required to have a nutrition facts table that will give you an indication of how much calcium and all of these other nutrients are on there. If you look at the percent daily value, if it's over 15%, it's likely a good source of that nutrient. Dairy is a very important contributor of protein within the Western context. Protein is very important. It basically makes up everything in your body, like anything you can touch, see. The structure of things are made out of protein. Older adults that have low protein intakes often have increased loss in muscle mass, and that can have big effects for their ability to live independently. Most nut milks and even other you know, plant-based yogurts and cheeses, the amounts of protein in these products are quite low compared to the dairy alternative. However, now I'm starting to see some, like Silk has a, like a protein milk option that does have a comparable level of protein to dairy milk, so about eight grams per cup. So I think maybe that's also starting to happen. But again, I'd say just keep an eye out on the nutrition label, especially if prioritizing protein is important to you. How was your protein intake throughout the week? It was a little bit lower than it was just because I, I had been incorporating like a whey-based protein powder mm -hmm. you know, in recent months. So I had to eliminate that. Yesterday I did try like a hemp-based protein mm. powder that my partner was using because sometimes whey bothers him. I would say that the taste was, oh sorry, it was a plant-based protein powder that had a bunch of different things. I think it had pea and it definitely had hemp. It could really taste. The hemp was really coming through. <laughs> the hemp was really coming through. So I did not enjoy it, to be totally honest. Mm. But I mean, I, that was one product, as uh, one brand. So I mean, you know. I will say plant-based proteins, like powders, generally, I've tried a lot because yeah. uh, the company I work for makes different protein powders. Sometimes we do comparisons of things. And... Uh, 
we've tried a lot. Even whey-based ones used to have a kind of a bad reputation. The ones that I've tried recently, they're all delicious, I feel. Like across the board, they're actually quite good. So I was like, oh yeah, I'm sure the plant-based ones are also mm. just as good with this no. one. And this is one where like the reviews were so positive. I think some of the plant-based people are deluding themselves. I, ha I have to say, because I've seen ones where the things are positive. I'm like, do you have taste buds? I had to choke it down and like, I, I don't normally choke mm -hmm. down food like that, mm -hmm. so I mean... I think for myself, the protein intake throughout the week wasn't bad because I was still eating meat. It's not that my protein intake was low, it's just not... It was lower. lower. Yeah, because okay. I think I was typically around like the 120 grams and yeah. this time I was like a little under 100. Yeah, you're like also a relatively small person, so they normally do protein intakes per, per kilogram. kilogram of body weight. I do think though, because I wasn't having dairy, my protein wasn't spaced out as much throughout the day. I was having most of it at dinner time when, like, mm -hmm. when I was having like a meat, like a big meat portion. Now, is there any reason why a plant-based alternative could actually be superior to a dairy alternative? And the answer actually is yes. One place in which it might be better is fiber content. This isn't necessarily true across the board. Oat-based milks do tend to have a little bit more fiber, maybe about three grams of fiber per cup of the milk. Although that I'm seeing, it's very brand dependent. Mm -hmm. So again, if you are trying to amp up your protein intake, definitely check the nutrition facts table of the product you're buying. The fiber intake? What did I say? Protein. <laughs> did I say protein? Yes, you did. Yeah. Sometimes I black out. When oh, I'm yeah. Talking. Yeah. So I don't know if you this camera sometimes. The camera. Just... I know. Like, I also say a bunch of things, and then I'm like, I have no idea what I just said. And I look at you, and I'm just, as long as you seem okay with it, I'm like, okay. Honestly, sometimes I black out while you're talking too. <laughs> not anything. So I can't you. rely on you. No. So we're not very good at listening to each other. I don't know. Or to ourselves. No. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, anyway. we're, we're professionals. But you all should listen here. to us. Yes. yes. You should also be good at listening to us. You we're not really listen to each other or ourselves. You know, we're, we're professional. We are professionals. Here. And you know, with oats, um, they have a really great kind of fiber called beta glucan fiber, which has been shown to be very beneficial in reducing blood glucose, can help reduce blood lipids. So that's things like cholesterol and triglycerides. We can only get fiber from plant foods. Another nutrient that you might see more of in certain plant based milks is actually omega 3s, which actually is a nutrient that a lot of us aren't getting enough of. Hemp and flax-based milks can be a good source of omega-3. Overall, so you did a day including dairy to try to meet your nutrition targets, and then we did several days of doing it without dairy. Yeah. How would you compare the experiences? So I will say the two days that I did with dairy were not really typical for me, but I will say like, I got to my dairy target in like two seconds. Today, I'm having cereal with milk, which is a little bit atypical for me, but I just thought milk, great source of calcium. I am now at the office and it's about like 11 or so and I'm feeling a bit peckish so I've decided to indulge in one of our office snacks which are these little cheeses but uh, apparently in each one of these you get 12% of your daily calcium let me double check that but I believe it's 12% so by having two of these I'm basically I'm already at 93% of my daily calcium needs looking back on the past couple of days a big portion of my calcium has come from dairy and specifically cheese cheese very very high in calcium no surprise i was there by like my morning snack me too all i had to do was i had some yogurt my usual intake yesterday put me at about 670 milligrams so i need to add about 330 milligrams on top of that uh so what i'm gonna do is have a little yogurt snack the yogurt is not like a huge part of my dietary rotation for no reason really like i genuinely do enjoy yogurt it's just not something that i have in in my fridge that often it's not something that i think to purchase for this particular type of yogurt for three quarters of a cup i had 250 milligrams of calcium just one tip though greek yogurt and stuff is all the rage and greek yogurt is amazing because of its higher protein content but that type of yogurt does have lower levels of calcium than the non-Greek alternative. You know, depending on what you're working on, like whether you're trying to increase your protein intake or your calcium intake, just take a look at the nutrition facts table to see what might be more appropriate for you. And uh, like a piece of cheese. I decided to also add in a Baby Bell cheese. Uh, this little cheese has an impressive 150 milligrams of calcium in it. And I actually think just between this and the yogurt, I think I'm gonna end up hitting the, a thousand milligrams cheese? That's, that's all i had to add like i knew obviously cheese had calcium but like cheese has so much calcium i had it and then i was like basically there and then i had like a little piece of cheese and i was like oh that's it when we transitioned to non-dairy and i had to cut out some of like the random whey stuff and then 
I didn't have the cheese and the yogurt. I did have to be a little bit more intentional with all my regular foods, with all the little bit of here and there and like the vegetables and stuff. I still needed like about 500 milligrams. So that's where yeah. the tofu came in and the, the salmon came in. Okay. So what got me there? Seeds and the non-dairy milks. The bioavailability of nutrients varies across different foods, right? So that is an important consideration as well. With milk and milk products, we know that they have a high amount of calcium in it and that calcium tends to be moderately bioavailable. Now with the plant-based option, so a lot of like vegetables and seeds and stuff, we're kind of seeing both ends of the spectrum. There's certain foods like Brussels sprouts and kale and cauliflower that have lower amounts of calcium than dairy products, but their bioavailability is actually over 50%. And then on the flip side, you have foods like spinach or Swiss chard that also has calcium, but their bioavailability is like under 5%. The thing is here is really making sure that you get a variety of different foods so that you're getting lots of different sources of calcium that your body can take out and, you know, preparing foods in different ways. And ultimately, I think that's the key takeaway of like most healthy eating messages. It is important to get a variety of foods and ideally a variety of minimally processed foods. So that's vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, and if you're including animal products, lean meats and dairy products as well. And you might be wondering, well, if I'm low in calcium, like why can't I just take a supplement? And you know, I think that absolutely is an option. These supplements are there and available to kind of possibly bridge any nutritional gaps. I will say, you know, typically we find that the food first approach seems to be more conducive to these positive health outcomes. For example, we talked about calcium and its impact on bone health. When we're talking about how calcium intake through food can positively impact bone health, we don't necessarily always see that same effect with people that tend to supplement with calcium. When you eat foods as a whole, you're getting kind of a food complex. So we like to focus on like individual nutrients, but it's not just how you interact with the individual nutrients, it's how you interact with kind of that whole thing as a whole. So when we look at, you know, dairy foods, we see that they're positively associated with heart health. When we look at a lot of these plant foods that contain calcium in them, those are positively associated with all kinds of different health markers. But interestingly, when we look at calcium, Calcium. There's been a lot of really new research in this area that shows that perhaps calcium supplementation may be harmful for heart health. There definitely needs to be more research done in the area. So if you can get enough calcium through food, that definitely should be plan A. And finally, if you are interested in learning how to incorporate more calcium into your diet, working with a dietitian may be beneficial as well because they'd be able to get to know you and your lifestyle and kind of give you tips and tricks to add more calcium into your diet without having to overhaul your entire life. Shameless profession <laughs> plugs. Go hire a dietitian. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you never miss a video and follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Thanks for watching. Bye!